So I'm super happy to be uh, speaking with all of you today. Um, we're going to go over game-based learning and how to keep students engaged and educators informed, especially during this, this new school paradigm where we might have some kids uh, who are working remotely at times and how to keep that motivation going for the kids. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, we're going to breeze through a lot of content here. I'm going to share my information. Please mark it down. I am completely accessible all the time. So you can email, call me. I'm based in Dartmouth, uh, Nova Scotia. So I'm hopefully not too far from most of you. Um, but I'm accessible all the time. Um, so, And I will share the link to this presentation as well. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen here. And Vanessa, maybe you can give me a just a verbal cue that says you can see this. Yeah, it says you are presenting. Great. Can you see my screen with a big orange monster? Currently, we're seeing your Google Meet screen. Okay, hold on. Let me try again. Okay. Try this again. Are you able to see my presentation? Not yet. No, we're seeing just the Google Meet again. Hmm. It seems like you're presenting with it. Like I can see that you can see it. Yeah. Hold on. I'm going to try again. It seems for some reason it's not. Uh, I'm going to put it outside of my window to see if that helps. All right. Let's see. There we go. This should work. Um, just one second. How's that? So I'm not seeing it, but uh, everybody else can see it. So maybe it's just something on my end. Okay. Which seems weird. Okay, you are getting feedback that others are seeing it though? Yeah. Okay. What I'll do is I'll keep going. Um, obviously, we're recording this. It, well, maybe you're not able to record it effectively. Um, but I can share the presentation, Vanessa, with you after. There, got it. Work on my screen. Got it. Okay, good. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to go over game-based learning. Like I said, keeping students engaged and educators informed. There's two parts to this. We're going to go over kind of the background for why this is important. And then I'm going to go into a bit of an implementation part. So we'll walk through uh, a couple games so you can see them, why they work really well with kids. They're both focused on literacy um, and how you can implement them in your programming and your, in your teaching. So there's a real kind of um, experiential part of this presentation as well. Um, so here's my information here. I'm on Twitter, Julia76, or you can always reach me at Julia at squigglepark.com. Uh, you can follow Squiggle Park and Dreamscape on Twitter as well. So I'll try to get through these first ones quickly. The reason we were inspired to do this project was because of research we were doing with Dalhousie University and Florida State University back in 2015. We were trying to do eye tracking to see if there were patterns that were predictive of reading challenges before kids got to grade three. And while we couldn't, uh, while we had some really interesting research, we couldn't get a product that would work in schools. But we did come across a lot of research that was super interesting about the amount of time kids were spending on screens. In fact, Carnegie Mellon released a study that said that kids are going to spend 10,000 hours video gaming by the time they graduate high school. So this is the same amount of time they spend in every subject by the time they graduate if they have perfect attendance. And at that point, we got extremely motivated to try to access this parallel track of learning to deliver the curriculum that we know is going to help them unlock their potential in life. And so along with that, we know that in, in the next 15 years, about 50% of our jobs in the U.S. and Canada are going to be uh, focused on machines and artificial intelligence. So it's going to be essential for our students to have skills that are unique um, to, to humans, such as collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking. These are referred to as higher order um, thinking skills or future ready skills. And one of the great benefits of games and game-based learning is that students practice these types of skills when they play. 
So these are kind of built into the economies of these games already. And so you can benefit, um, your kids can benefit just from uh, going through these games in terms of these future ready skills that they have to be prepared for. So this got us extremely motivated to, to really focus on replacing the junk food of screen time with the health food of learning. And we believe the time kids spend on screens is the biggest untapped opportunity um, for learning today. And our purpose at Squiggle Park and Dreamscape is to support educators in the delivery of the best education to all kids through video games they love. So our background with the um, Department of Education has gone back to um, 2014. So we started research and development uh, for Squiggle Park back in 2014. And then we started to have discussions with the department in 2015 about uh, with, with the curriculum teams and the literacy leads to really define the requirements for a program that would work in Nova Scotia for Nova Scotia teachers. Uh, we did field testing uh, in all 18 tri-county schools in 2016. So I spent months on the road driving from Dartmouth down to the tri-county in schools every day um, to understand how programs could be used effectively in schools. Uh, and so much of it was just usability, getting kids to log on effectively in the time that you have, um, making sure kids stay engaged, making sure the reports work for teachers. So that was a really great opportunity for us to be in the classroom here in Nova Scotia. And I've linked the report of what we, what we were able to achieve um, through that process there. We were listed on the Nova Scotia Book Bureau in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, um, we started to see great pickup um, from the schools in Nova Scotia who were using Squiggle Park. Um, in 2018, we also worked with the federal government in Canada with the Immigration Department. Locally, we worked with ISANS to study Squiggle Park and its effectiveness with English language learners. Uh, so we did a quite a large study with 1,500 ELL students and were able to show that in 15 weeks, we could help those kids catch up to their English peers in a in a reliable and repeatable way. And then this year in 2020, when COVID hit, we, we worked with the, with the government in Nova Scotia to partner to make sure that every teacher in the province of Nova Scotia will have access to our programs uh, in their schools uh, at no cost to the school. So this is a really great opportunity for us to share with you these programs, how they work. And so because you, you and all of your colleagues have access to these programs, right now um, at no cost to your, to your classroom or to your school. So we wanna make sure that, that you're aware of, of this partnership. A Little bit of background on me. Um, I've uh, worked to found four tech companies over the years. The most notable was Google's first premier North American partner. So I worked down in Mountain View, California on the Google campus for several years, innovating uh, technologies for business. Um, really learned about how to create really great iterative, iterative technologies that are engaging. And I was there at Google when they first launched their Google for Education um, platform and they started, I had actually access to one of their first Chromebooks. So I was really interested in, in what they were doing in education back then. Uh, recognized um, as one of the top 50 women in STEM and this is a real passion point for me helping young girls understand the opportunities in the STEM fields um, and and really how we can get more girls to to participate in STEM. I was an Olympian uh, back in 2000 that's what brought me to Nova Scotia from Northern Ontario and I've loved living here ever since I came in 1995 um, but I think the the most important piece of that is Having grown up in a small town in Northern Ontario, I really have realized that kids have so much untapped potential and, and it's only through the, the great guidance of amazing teachers that these kids really get the chance to, to be coached to recognize that potential. And, and so I have so much respect for the profession of teaching and your, your ability to coach these kids to really um, achieve great things in life. So I'm highly motivated to support you in that. I have four amazing kids all in the uh, school system here in Nova Scotia. My oldest is off to Acadia next year and my youngest is five <laughs> and just going into grade one. So I'm right across the whole spectrum. So these are two, the two middle kids that I have, Max and Phoenix, and, and I've put them in here because they were inspirations for me to start this program. Uh, both were the same age going through school and both had very different experiences. Uh, Max, who struggled with reading um, tremendously by the time he reached grade four, he was identified as a low reader and really sent to, to see um, a psychologist to see if there was something 
diagnosable, whereas Phoenix was a very, very high reader and not um, being challenged in the classroom. As a parent, I had no idea how to help them. I really was not armed with the right tools to help my kids with reading and literacy. And like a lot of parents, I unfortunately just said, oh, the school system will deal with it. And since then, I've realized how much of a mistake that is and how we have to work as parents with teachers and with the education system to truly support literacy. So I've made sure that the programs that we create work also in the classroom, but also at home because parents need these tools to help their kids as well. Now with COVID, even more than ever. So we did decide to focus on literacy first, um, one, because of my personal experience, but also because this is the most foundational building block to all other learning. Uh, in fact, there's quite a bit of research that links comprehension to uh, a, a nation's GDP, because being able to have strong comprehension is also what allows you to have uh, learning and process academic application. Now, what's, what's disappointing uh, is the research that we've seen that shows that um, as gaming has been increasing over the last couple decades, significantly and consistently, there's been an equal and opposite correlation with reading declining. Um, the amount of reading is declining that kids are spending uh, time doing, but also uh, reading skills and reading test scores are declining. And, and it's no surprise that one of the best predictors of whether a child is going to be a strong reader is just the amount of time they're spending reading. So this is a very alarming thing, but we know that we can, we can change this by delivering strong literacy skills and reading through awesome games kids love. And just to drive it home a little bit more, kids five to seven these days are spending, 66% uh, of them are spending seven and a half hours a week gaming online. By the time they're 15, it's 70, 70, 77%. We're playing games for about 12 hours a week. So we have an obligation to make sure that this time is not uh, wasteful and this time is actually spent helping them um, be successful in the skills they need to move forward in life. So what are some of the problems game-based learning can solve? So we know that classrooms have increasingly diverse learners and they have a need for personalized instruction and, and adaptive instruction. So we've got kids at all different levels of skill and it's very hard for teachers to be able to meet them where they are in terms of their level and address them with personalized learning. But technology can help here. Uh, there's a lot of areas where technology can't help in teaching, but this is definitely one where technology can be a huge tool to help. Uh, we also have hybrid learning environments. Um, so we saw this uh, really pop up now with COVID where Every student is required to stay motivated while surrounded by distractions. So we're gonna have kids in classrooms with teachers by their side who are helping keep them motivated and coached to stay interested in learning. But we also have situations now where kids are spending a lot of time learning from home. Tons of distractions, every kid's environment is uniquely different. And we need to have programs that are getting them engaged in their learning so that they're partners in their learning. They're not just being delivered things to have to do for homework. And finally, we've got kids with super high expectations for engaging content. So we've got kids playing, you know, really, really um, sophisticated games, video games at home, and they want to see the same kind of content when they're doing their learning. And unfortunately, so few programs can give them that level of engagement um, with the learning content. So I mentioned that we started building programs back in 2016. The first one we built was Squiggle Park. This has um, been a very collaborative effort with, with teachers and, and the department here in Nova Scotia. Uh, it's preschool to grade two. Uh, it's focused on independent play so kids can play by themselves in a classroom, by themselves at home or in small groups, but it's focused on independent play. It's often used in a classroom in a station rotation setting uh, or in centers. It can be used for reward time. We've even seen it used in the principal's office if somebody's waiting <laughs> to get a little uh, talking to about something just to keep them um, focused. Uh, kids love this game and it really helps them develop their phonemes, phonemic awareness, their word work, spelling, vocabulary, all those early foundational skills. And um, there's 305 game levels in Squiggle Park that kids move through. Um, to master those skills. Uh, 
We also have a program called Dreamscape that was uh, launched in 2019. It has 1.5 million players using it now. Uh, it's an older program, and you can tell from its interface, it's much more sophisticated. Kids really love the the game um, aspect, but it's for grades three to eight, multiplayer, so kids can play with their friends, um, which is super important for that social aspect. And it's upper elementary literacy, so it's comprehension. And I'll review the skills in a later slide, so you can see those. Now, this slide's really important because I want to really drive home the fact that gamification is not game-based learning. A lot of programs out there have gamification or, you know, drag and drop, you know, the ability to collect a badge, for instance. That, those are gamification features. That is not a true game, and kids really recognize that uh, when they're delivered a, a, a program that, that isn't that engaging. So... On the market today, we have games uh, or programs, sorry, that have proven efficacy and that are curriculum aligned. So we've got ones like Raz Kids and Lexia, I sell a whole bunch of different ones that that uh, do work in terms of delivering curriculum. But frankly, kids don't stay engaged in these programs. And I think a lot of teachers saw that during COVID when kids were asked to do these programs at home, the engagement levels were just going through the floor, really, really not successful. Um, on the flip side, we're having to compete with these super fun and engaging games like Fortnite and Clash of Clans and so many others, but they don't have any research-based learning content. So they're not helpful for us as educators to help kids um, get their learning. Where we fit is in this really kind of special spot. Our games are super, super fun and engaging like those they play outside the classroom, but they have proven efficacy and they're curriculum aligned um, to what you're teaching in your classroom. Now the reason this isn't done very often, the reason real games for learning is not yet a very common thing is because it's very difficult to achieve. So you need to be doing, you have to be keeping kids in an area um, called their zone of proximal development. Uh, and this has to be done both on the game side and in the learning content. So the zone of proximal development is a special place where um, when kids are um, participating in an activity, it's not so easy that they're gonna get bored, but it's not so hard that they're gonna be frustrated. They're at this perfect point of being pushed or challenged is a good word, um, to go a little bit further and to push themselves to do a little bit better. That's why games are so successful at having a great growth mindset because kids will fail in a game and then they'll be motivated um, to jump back in and to achieve and keep pushing their skills. And so what we're doing with our games is we're, we're, we're um, having kids perform right in their zone of proximal development in terms of the game economies, but also in the learning content. And the way we do that is through sophisticated uh, learning algorithms that, that adapt to the player's skill level. So it pushes them to slightly more difficult content as they master uh, their content in the games. So we've done a lot of research in terms of game-based learning and, and understanding what motivates kids. So when you're looking for programs, aside from Squiggle Park and Dreamscape, when you're looking at other programs on the market that you want to test with your kids, look for some of these factors uh, because these are highly engaging for kids. So kids love um, the ability to build. So opportunities to create something of their own um, and to encourage ownership and, and retention. This is the... This is the um, idea of them having um, having control over their experience. And great games give them a sense of control, even though they're being guided um, through the experience in a way that's going to help them be most effective at learning. It should be challenging. There should be features designed to challenge their ability to have a growth mindset. Positive failure is positive. Um, kids actually respond extremely well to, to positive failure and that encourages them to keep going. It's something that we, failure is a concept that we do get concerned about because we don't want kids to be experiencing negative failure. But if it's done in a positive sense, the growth mindset that they, they uh, develop is just exceptional. Um, collecting, they love the ability to collect. And really great games have economies where kids can collect resources and rewards based on their mastery in the learning. So you always want to look for how a game is connecting the learning to um, the really fun parts of the game. Because one of the challenges in game-based learning that I've seen in, in other programs is you can have kids spending too much time in the gaming side of things 
and not enough in the learning. So those two things have to be very carefully connected. And finally, exploring. So really presenting a sense of autonomy um, in the game so, so kids feel like they are able to control that experience. It's, it's structured or free form. It doesn't matter. It can be either. Um, and, and that often depends on the needs of the curriculum, on whether they can just kind of free form explore or whether they're kind of pushed down a certain pathway. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about Squiggle Park and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the game and give you um, some insight in how the game and the mechanics are tied to the learning. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we'll just start right in. I'm going to be jumping in and out of the presentation so I'm hoping that we can make sure that you guys can see uh, my screen. So Vanessa what I'm going to do is I'm going to check with you when I jump into the game to make sure you can see what I'm showing. Um, so just to remind you, um, pre-K or pre-primary to grade two, um, and the, the focus of this game is to help kids learn their uh, foundational reading skills. You can see these pictures of kids here in Nova Scotia playing the games. Um, they really do love it. They really stay motivated and engaged. And it's a perfect game to be getting kids to play if you're working in, uh, in small groups because kids will stay um, completely enveloped and engaged in these games without distracting the rest of the class. Here's a, here's a picture of a teacher using the games uh, in her class. Uh, I think it's important to note that they work on the browser, so you can use them on Chromebooks or desktops, um, but you can also use them uh, on mobile devices like uh, Apple devices and, and any kind of Android device. And I just want to reiterate, and this is going to become even more important this fall, as we have some situations where hybrid learning is going to be still be in play. Um, there's home support with Squiggle Park and with Dreamscape. So whenever you set up a class and set up your students, you're going to get a, a PDF that's generated with for each one of your students that can be sent home for the parents. And this really helps parents swap out the junk food of screen time with the health food of learning. So please understand that you can be such a great help for these parents to understand that they have access to this program for free as well. And what's great on your end is you can monitor the progress of the students who are playing from home. So let's, uh, here's some pictures just of some of our Nova Scotia kids using the program. Uh, but let's take a look. I'm going to open this up. And Vanessa, this is where I'm going to ask you just to confirm you can see my screen still. Yes, I can. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so when you go to squigglepark.com um, to our website here, you're gonna see that there's two sides of the website. Uh, Squiggle Park is over here on the left and Dreamscape's over here on the right. Uh, depending on which program you, you would use with your students, um, you would click on, on whatever side you need. If you have a teacher account for one, you have a teacher account that can access both. Your username and password can be used to access both uh, programs. So when you're on each side of the site, the header bar is the same. So you can download the app here if you want to play it on a uh, mobile device. But student play is going to get you into the game experience. And then this login button here allows you to log in as a teacher and view um, the, the uh, dashboards where you can see student progress. But let's, let's go into student play here. And let's take a look at the game. So one of the things that we did in, in that experience in the Tri-County Schools was to make sure that logging in um, was extremely easy for kids. Um, Welcome to Squiggle Park. Just gonna turn off the music there. Um, what I've seen in classrooms with technologies, and this is a huge frustration for teachers, is especially with the little ones, you know, the, the primary students, grade ones, it can take them a full 15 minutes to get a class to log into a, a, a program, which is basically the whole time that you have for them to be at that center at that station. So we knew we had to make it super simple for kids to be able to log in. Enter your access code. So teachers will have an access code for every classroom. So the gray, um, the gray icons get you into your classroom. And if you have the same classroom you're using every day, you can bookmark this. But it's simple um, picture codes um, that kids really uh, are able to remember quickly. These are hobbies, nature. These are uh, shapes and transportation. So book, square, 
um, paintbrush they ship tree. This is my class code. Find your player card. Now, when you bookmark your class code, you're going to have your player card. So your kids would normally come in on this screen and they would see their player cards. They've got a little icon to remember who they are and then obviously their name. Enter your player code to enter the park. You're going to notice here that every single screen has an audio prompt as well. These games are meant to be used for with kids who have no literacy at all. So if you've got kids who are coming to you with absolutely no experience in even letter names and letter sounds, that's okay. The game's been, been built to support them. So this is a player code. So music, leaf, square, spaceship is my code. If they happen to mess up and, and put in the wrong thing, they don't have to delete. They just press the new button that they know is the right one. Now, what teachers often do with the codes is they'll print these out and, and put them on a binder ring so that kids can go through and find their codes or maybe just stick them to the desk. Uh, I find that even with the primary students, after they've logged in two, three times, they remember their codes. Um, so although you can support them at the beginning, you'll find that they really uh, are able to start to log in simply on their own. So once the kids have entered their code, they're going to be entered to the game at their specific level. So depending on where they left the game last time, they're going to be brought back at their level. You can see here, um, there's all these little monsters. Uh, there's 25 monsters. Every one of them is connected to a different world. And in each world, there's a whole bunch of different levels that they have to work through. And you can see here that the stars, all three stars have been collected on all these worlds. And like right to the end, yeah. So this world is completely done down to um, level 12 and you can see level 12 can't be accessed yet because level 10 hasn't been completed so what this does for you as an educator is it makes sure that the kids aren't jumping ahead in content that's too difficult it really forces them down a path in this er and in the early reading skills this is really important the scaffolded approach but it's down a path that that's focused on their mastery once they master a skill they're moved into something that's slightly, slightly more different difficult what we've done to build in a sense of autonomy, though, is we've built these pathways so kids can choose their pathways, and it doesn't matter which one they go down, they're going to be mastering the same skills that allow them to move through the game. And so all these levels are different types of levels. Some of them are matching, um, some of them are phonemes, some of them are ending sounds or starting sounds. There's spelling ones, uh, spelling games, and I'll just show you that here. Arrange the sounds to create the word. Slap. So slap. They have to. They have to um, spell the word just based on the sounds. Now, in some of the spelling ones, you'll see the letters and you'll only hear the word. So there's all different formats um, that these games present the skills. So slap. Slap. And what your kids can do is they can do ending sounds, so they might know that it ends with p, and so they can start with that one. Slap. In. So you can see here that I was successful, so I moved my progress bar ahead, um, and I didn't lose any hearts. Now, in, let's say I do in. I, I. Arrange the sounds to create the word. So if I get it wrong, what it does is it lets me attempt it again, but it shows me that I've lost a heart. If I lose five hearts in a specific level, it will bump me out and move to me to slightly easier content. And this is a big part of that zone of proximal development, making sure that kids are not getting too frustrated. They get bumped out to slightly easier content before they get frustrated in the skill. So I'm just going to move back out to the main, uh, to the worlds here. And what you're going to see is as kids move through the worlds, um, they need 80% of their stars collected in a previous world to unlock the later world. So you can see in world 20, I've only collected four or 42 stars in here. So I haven't been able to unlock world 21. We show the kids the monster that's coming to get them excited about what, what monster they can unlock, but they aren't able to do it until they've shown mastery of world 20. And then in, in world 22, you can't even see, you only have a shadow of the monster, so you can't see what it is. 
Uh, and this gets kids really excited to, to move forward and, and unlock their worlds. What we do find is kids want to get all of their stars. So kids are able to go into earlier levels to be able to collect stars that they might have missed. And this increases practice and increases automaticity um, of the skills. In the later worlds, we reintroduce some of the earlier skills to make sure that kids really truly did learn them with automaticity and that they weren't able to just memorize them. So the game's been built um, with tons of research and development to make sure that by the time they finish all 25 worlds, they've mastered all their skills with automaticity. Now there's some other really fun features. Um, when kids finish uh, a world, they're delivered a poem. Uh, and the poem is designed for them to be able to read either in the game or outside of the game. Um, so it offers some blended learning. And the poem in World 1 starts as a super, super easy poem, and they get progressively more difficult. So by the time the child gets to, to the 25th world, um, they're mastering, uh, they're not only just mastering their skills, they're able to demonstrate that they can actually read these poems. So super fun uh, game for kids, but also very, very simple. And I think that's really important. Uh, we've tested this program with um, kids who have autism, and it's it's a highly effective program um, for these littles who are struggling with autism. And, and it's because of the flat nature of the graphics and the, there's not too many distractions. So, um, so if you have kids really who are on all different levels of, of skill and ability, they really can be playing the same game uh, with their peers, which is great. Julia, um, we have two questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. One is, uh, would Squiggle Park be too young for a student who is in grade four but is reading and writing at the primary level? And can you have two teachers in one class account? What you can do, okay, I'm going to start with the second question. Um, so you can have two teachers who share a student or share a classroom of students. So basically, once you set up your teacher account, when you're adding your students, as long as you're in the same school, you can share students within that school. Every school in Nova Scotia has a school code um, that's been provided to them. Um, and once you link up to your school code, you can, you can have access to all the students on that roster. Back to the first question. Uh, Vanessa, what was it again? Just Oh, is it too young? Is it too young? Yes, it is too young. Older kids are going to find this too babyish, um, which is a problem. So what we did, um, because there's a lot of, I'm just going to multitask here. There's a lot of kids who are still reading at a grade one level, grade two level, who are older and more sophisticated in terms of the content they expect. And so Dreamscape, the skills in the game, I would not start a child on Dreamscape until grade three because the game is much more sophisticated but the skills go down to grade one. And I won't spend too, too much time um, in here, but I'll show you just quickly. Dreamscape student play, you're gonna notice is very different. Um, and it is to respond to these older kids. So I'll open this up here. And the, the skills in here, they've, they, we start with the early, learning, early reading skills, but then we move into um, comprehension and all the higher level comprehension skills. Mm -hmm. So kids can set up their own accounts here. Um, they can set up a student account and then uh, when you have your teacher account, you just share your uh, teacher code with them and as soon as they put it into their account, they'll be linked to your class. You can also sign your roster up with, with uh, Google single sign-on with Dreamscape. Um, but I think even by the graphics, you can see this is built really nicely for older kids. And don't get overwhelmed here. <laughs> it's a there's a lot to look at when you see Dreamscape. This is my account. I've been playing for over two years, um, and so you can see that there's a lot happening on my base. The concept of Dreamscape is that you have this vision core right here. This is where your dreams live. Mine's being upgraded right now, um, and I have to protect my vision core and my dreams from my friends coming in to challenge my base. So I build these yeah. walls, I build yeah. these defenses like this Kraken, and then I get resources like Imaginanium tanks to be able to build more things out on my, uh, on my base. If I build something, it takes some time to upgrade since yeah. everything can be upgraded to a level 12 on your base, even individual walls. Yeah. 
this little wall can be upgraded to a, a level 12. It's only at a level one. And to upgrade things, you have to answer questions and demonstrate mastery. So you can see my vision course being upgraded. Yeah. I have to answer 97 questions at this point because I'm at level 10 uh, before this is going to be upgraded. So it's a big effort on my part. Uh, I'm upgrading yeah. over here to my Dreamweaver, and it needs 67 questions. But look at right here. Yeah. My temple is being updated, and I only need eight more questions before this gets updated. As soon as I have this updated or upgraded, my my builders will be freed up to build something else on my base. So everything in this base, um, when you start, you have nothing on your base at all except for your vision core. And kids add their different um, elements to their base by going to this question um, box. Um, this is an independent question, so there's no associated passage. A lot of the a lot of the uh, questions have a passage first that you have to read and then answer the associated question. So, what does someone mean if they use the term "same difference" to compare two topics? And so, um, you can answer the question. I'm not even going to. Um, I'm going to just. I probably got it wrong. Didn't read through fast enough. So I got it incorrect. It's going to show me the right answer. The two topics were relative. The same. It won't do anything in my base. Like I don't upgrade anything because I got it wrong and I have to go in and answer another question. Uh, everything in this game is completely tied to the learning. So one of the things I can do is go challenge my friends' bases, but I can't challenge right now because I don't have any challenges. If I try to challenge my friend's base, it will say, oh, sorry, you need to answer one more question to correctly to earn a challenge. So I'll go to the question, why is unbiased opinion an oxymoron? And so you have to answer that. And if you answer it correctly, you'll earn your challenge. Um, kids love this game because they can play with their friends. They have a friends list that they can go in and challenge. They have their classmates. So if you enter a classroom uh, into the game, you can have all your classmates here. Uh, and you can go in and you can challenge them um, specifically. Um, there's also login challenges. So if you come in every day for six days, you get this reward box. This is encouraging them to use it on their own at home. Um, and then there's also question challenges. So for every five questions I get correct, I get a special reward box. And that's built specifically so that kids aren't guessing on the answers to the content. A lot of kids, if they're not motivated, are gonna just breeze through the learning content and try to just guess. But if they do that, they lose their streaks and they lose their ability to, to get rewards. Yeah. They can train troops here and the troops go into their friends' bases to explore. But again, to get the troops, you need to um, answer a specific question. I didn't answer that one, so this is the same one I've got again. So this, this game, um, Dreamscape, is the only game of its kind on the market today that's a true video game that delivers literacy curriculum. It's a really outstanding way to get kids to want to drive their own reading. And kids who play Dreamscape are reading on average six times more than kids who don't play it. So the average reading amount versus kids who play Dreamscape. So this is a great way to get kids engaged in reading, but not just reading, also working on those comprehension skills that, that you're teaching them in the classroom. So you might do a lesson on personification uh, and then you can assign them content through the game where they can be working on personification questions. So it's a long answer to that to that question, but I think what it does is it brings me also into dashboards. So both Squiggle Park and Dreamscape have dashboards for teachers to be able to see player progress. So if you go, what I did there, just so you guys see, I, I went to the login button. If I click on login, I can log in with my educator account. And once I'm logged in, I'm able to see all of the classrooms that I've set up. So I set up my own classrooms and I can add my students to the classroom. I can either create a roster of students and then let them sign up with their account information or they can set up their own account and I can give them my class code. I'll show you that. So this is one of my classrooms. Um, it's just loading the data. The data is always real time. So if you have students playing, you see you see what they're doing in real time. Um, the main dashboard on both programs has an overview of all the questions that have been answered in the last seven days and overall. How many questions were correct in the last seven days and overall? And and in this case, it has how many passages were read. 
you look at your top struggling struggling skills, your top struggling players, and then the practice skills. So this gives you just a really high level dashboard of how kids are doing, and then how many questions your kids answered in the last seven days, and how many of them got the questions correct, their time overall. And this, the time I think is a really important piece to stick on for a minute because both programs, we recommend kids play 30 minutes a week at minimum. So if teachers can get kids playing 30 minutes a week, we find that then kids take it on themselves to really start playing the games in their spare time, really increasing their focus on, on uh, reading skills. So we always challenge teachers to find two 15 minute blocks or one 30 minute block where they can get kids playing. Uh, and a great way to do it, one of the things I've seen in classrooms here in, in Halifax is where teachers do do a lesson. So they maybe do a, a lesson on similes and metaphors, and then they go in and they get kids to, to play the game um, and work on an assignment that they've created focused on similes and metaphors. So I'm just going to show you the assignments feature here. Assignments are great. We find assignments were the number one um, feature that teachers used when COVID hit because kids were at home and they needed to still assign them specific content. So what you can do is you can create an assignment and you can create, I'm gonna do it based on skills for my grade four students. And I want them to work, let's say I'm gonna get them to work on symbolism and Im imagery. And I'm gonna give them 10 symbolism questions and 10 imagery questions. And I want all my kids in the class to work on it. I could just select a couple kids or, you know, groups, but in this case, I'm going to get them all to work on it. Um, I'm going to just call it um, this week's lesson. And I'm going to choose, I'm going to get them to do it over the first week of August. We'll do August 3rd to 7th. So what's awesome about this, I'm going to say done. Um, and I'm going to go to the month of August and I can see this week's lesson is scheduled for the week of the 3rd to the 7th. I can see here nobody has started it. I've got 20 students in this lesson. Nobody started it. No one has any correct answers. What's it focused on? Um, when it, when's it over? Here's a basically a report card of all the, all the questions. You can, if you hover over each one, you can see the specific skill they're working on. And you'll be able to see uh, check marks or X's if they get it right or wrong. And then underneath here, you, you see every specific question broken down. Which of the following symbols would not be best used to represent athleticism, sneakers, a dumbbell, a thermometer, a net, or a goal? And so you'll be able to see which students answered it, who got it correct, who didn't. And you can, you can print these report cards too. So they can be really easily shared with parents if you want to so show where parents can be working. Uh, with her kids at home. There's other reports in the game, tons of them. So you can see reading level reports um, where you see your entire class and what level they're reading at. Individual students progress over time. So this student started at a grade two reading level and increased their skill. They, they kind of, they practiced here and didn't increase their skill very much and in fact struggled with some certain skills. This is usually a sign of a teacher intervention. So teachers come in and said, okay, you're struggling with this skill, we're gonna work on it. And then they really bump up their skills. So there's all these great reports. We've made them to be very, very simple in the dashboards, both Squiggle Park and Dreamscape. Um, and uh, we really recommend that teachers keep an eye on these at least once a week. It can really help inform instruction. It can really help inform remediation. It can also help inform um, uh, parents on what they can be working on with their kids at home. So there's a lot to look at there. I'll pause. Vanessa, I think you hear you. Yeah. Uh, so there was just a question. If Squiggle Park also offers those same features of creating assignments and reports. So Squiggle Park, I'm going to go into its dashboard. It doesn't have assignments because as I showed you in Squiggle Park, there's a very specific way kids are um, expected to move through the uh, the program it's very scaffolded so unlike dreamscape where you can work on on um, you know maybe symbolism one week in squiggle park they're moving through first letter names letter skills up to phonemes and and some sight words up to more difficult uh, phonemic awareness and vocabulary so it is scaffolded but there is uh, there is a dashboard of squiggle park too 
So I'll log into that one. So you're gonna see very similar, you see all my classes. You can see how many kids I have in each class here. Uh, it's got some, some, some uh, guides here to help support you. Um, but let me just go into one of the classes here. So I can see at the top here, teacher plays great because you can go into every world and you don't have to unlock it. It basically unlocks the whole game for you. So you can go in and experience every world and all the skills. Um, you can see the most difficult stage player making least progress, most progress, same as Dreamscape. And then you can start to see your students. So I'm gonna look at Nisha here. This is her specific player code, uh, but you can see she's mastered two stages. She's earned five stars. Uh, and how many questions she's answered. So I'll go in here. She hasn't been playing over the last seven days. Um, but underneath here, this is just a demo account. Underneath here, you can see that her progress will be shown like this. She completed world one, level one. It's unlocked. She mastered it. She earned three stars. And she did it on her first attempt. She didn't have to have any additional attempts. If she struggled with it, you're going to see how many times she attempted it. And this number could be two, three, four, and this color will be red here. And this is super helpful because it, it will allow teachers to see where are they getting stuck. Uh, and then it has a description of what the level is, matching uppercase letters with the audio of the letter name on both question and answers. So um, this is world one, and you can go into all the different worlds. Now Nisha is obviously just at world one, so she's, she's here. One of the things that Squiggle Park has that, that Dreamscape doesn't um, is these mini lessons. And these are really helpful um, for teachers and for parents. So if you do have a student who's struggling on this level, you click on the mini lesson. And what it will do is it will download a PDF for you that you can print or you can share via email for a parent to use at home. And basically, this is just a, a lesson for teaching graphing and phoneme correspondences. So it'll give you a teacher. Uh, Q, so the monkey climbed the muddy mountain. Who climbed the mountain? The students asked the question. The teacher would say the words monkey, muddy, and mountain begin with the same sound. Mm -hmm. Watch my mouth. Mm -hmm. Can you say mm? So these are all little lessons and um, corresponding resources for you to use with kids to be practicing. So parents really love these because oftentimes they just don't know what they should be doing to work with their kids. Uh, on specific um, skills. So these are the dashboards for Squiggle Park. Very, very simple, um, but highly effective in showing where kids are. So those are, so that's just a super quick overview of both programs. There's so much probably to go through um, with each. One thing that you might want to look at um, as, a, as a teacher, I should probably, I'm just gonna open up the website again. Back to Squiggle Park. If you're interested in seeing every skill that's taught in Squiggle Park, there's a Squiggle Park content key. And it shows basically what's in every world at every level. So we'll describe the world. So in world one, kids are introduced to letters in small groups. They practice identifying, naming, matching, uppercase and lowercase letters. In this, in this case, there's no GPCs and high frequency words because this is just the basic letter names, letter matching, letter sounds. As they get into world two, they start to move into grapheme, phoneme correspondences and high frequency words. And so you can start to see on every level, what are they doing? So this is a great content key um, for teachers to use. I'm going to quickly run through, since we're focused on game-based learning, I know we're coming to the end, I just want to re, I want to kind of review some of the features that are really important um, to connect kids to the learning. So some of the attributes of a successful game, the game mechanics must be aligned to increase mastery of the reading comprehension or the learning in, in other games. So in Dreamscape, I mentioned streaks. If kids uh, get questions right in a row, they start building their streaks and they get reward boxes. So that's a great example. In Squiggle Park, a great example is stars. They're collecting their stars. The second, um, the second one is encouraging a sense of pride over their base. Um, so leveling up their resources and defenses or in Squiggle Park, they're collecting their monsters. So these are great examples of how uh, we're getting them to encourage a sense of pride over their game. We're also providing continuous assessment. So in both games, you're gonna be getting a dashboard with the progress of the students. And then you also, on the Dreamscape side, have leaderboards. So kids can actually see 
uh, where they stand with their friends and, and uh, be challenged to compete with their friends. And then I'll uh, offer a space for multiplayer as kids get older. So above that grade three level, kids really value multiplayer experiences. And so um, the ability to challenge bases and explore bases becomes extremely important. And finally, rewards for achievement to motivate more play. So in, in Dreamscape, you've got reward boxes and challenges. And in Squiggle Park, we've got Squiggle Bits, which I didn't talk about, um, which are just, it's a currency in Squiggle Park that allows kids to purchase fun little objects if they master their levels. Uh, and then the poems at the end of every level, those are encouraging for kids who love, uh, love poetry and love to read. Everything is learned, everything is earned through learning. So as we went through Squirrel Park, players must demonstrate mastery. Uh, every player is presented um, reading skills or comprehension skills at their zone of proximal development. And these increase or decrease in difficulty based on their ability. When you enter a player into Squiggle Park or Dreamscape, don't be stressed about it. You can put them in at their grade level or you know, slightly above or below based on where you think they are. But the algorithms are going to make sure that they get leveled to their specific zone of proximal development. So don't, I, I know a lot of teachers that I've worked with are like, I'm not sure where to put them in. Don't worry about it. It will level them into the right content um, uh, as they play. We have, in terms of specific support for Nova Scotia teachers, we have a whole series of educator training videos here. They were done by Christy Mc, McNeil down in the SSRCE. Um, and this is a playlist, so you can check out every one of these um, videos that are designed specifically to show you um, Squiggle Park and how, how to get set up with a game. I mentioned the skills mastered. So in Squiggle Park, we're looking at phonemes, phoneme awareness, word work, spelling, sentence structure. In Dreamscape, you get into um, the comprehension skills. And I have a framework here that really is a, a really good um, diagram showing um, exactly how that is. So we start with the foundational skills here. Well, we go from no literacy and our adaptive algorithm really bring kids through the foundational reading skills in Squiggle Park as we went through into independent skills like parts of speech, punctuation, prefixes and suffixes and so on. On again to advanced reading skills like tone, mood, predicting, purpose, symbolism, inferring. And finally, you get into cross academic applications. So when kids start to have a strong sense of comprehension, they can look at different themes. They can also look at different genres, like content that, uh, that speaks to science or social studies, for, for instance. And that brings them to higher order thinking, which is what we're trying to help the kids do. Um, so we're here as a tool for you to really help get kids through this pathway. Um, Squiggle Park itself has been um, aligned to the Fountas and Pinnell levels. So this is just a chart to help you reference how Squiggle Park worlds. Um, so world, um, worlds one all the way through 25 align with the letter grades. And that's been a helpful reference for some teachers. And then finally, I'm gonna just finish up quickly with some strategies. So learn the games. What I highly recommend is spend just a few minutes on each of the games, trying them out, getting a good sense of it. Kids love when the teachers play the games with them, especially Dreamscape. So if you have some time to play the game with your kids, they do really, really appreciate and love it. Find your classroom champions. You're gonna have kids who really, um, really understand digital technologies. They've had more experience, they've had more experience gaming. So find those champions and get them to be the teachers because sometimes the best teachers of these of the game, uh, gamified learning or, or games for learning are your classroom champions and they love having that ownership. Reward the students. So recognize the fact that they're collecting stars or they're collecting shards and recognize the leaderboard. You can even run tournaments. So a lot of schools have run tournaments between classes for pizza parties or even between schools within regions. Make sure you're sharing with parents. I can't say enough how much parents appreciate having these resources that they know are uh, tools that teachers are using in the classroom. Use the dashboard features. Um, they're there to help you. We're always here to learn more about what you need and to improve the dashboard features. So if you have feedback, let us know. We'll be always iterating. We, we release a new iteration every two weeks. And then supplement using traditional assignments. So I've seen teachers do this really well. Like I said, they do a lesson and then they get kids to work on the specific content in the games. 
This is a link, obviously, to the website. I do want to just emphasize, um, oftentimes in the home environment, kids are using the app. So the, there's a free app for both programs available on iTunes and on Google Play. And just a quick, uh, quick summary of the two games. Again, here are both the links. I will send this presentation out to make sure that you all get it. And this is available, again, at no cost to you. This is here to support you. Uh, you are all doing an amazing job of so much respect for how hard it is for teachers right now to be planning. And we just want to be here to help you. Um, very proud of the fact that this program was, was developed here in Nova Scotia. It's gone on to win international education awards and we'll continue to push it to be better. And we want to just make sure that we're here for all Nova Scotia students and teachers. So I just want to th say thank you all um, for, for being here with me today um and open it up for any questions thanks julie that was julie that was so amazing i know that everybody's loving it there's a lot of feedback about how positive it is one of the questions that did pop up a couple times was uh how do we get those school codes and who has them what i will do in this presentation we are going to be sending this presentation i think vanessa to everybody i or, or what i can do right now is put a link to the presentation in in the chat I will add a slide to this live deck. So this is this is a, a live deck. I'll add a, a link with the school codes so that everybody can get those. They are available um, through the Department of Education and I think through the regions themselves, but just to make it easier, I'll put it right in the deck. Perfect, that's awesome. I've also put a link in uh, the chat uh, for those of you who this may be your last session. It's just a feedback form on um, the overall IT camp. So if this is your last session, which hopefully it's not, since it's the first one of the three days, uh, if you could take a few minutes to do that as well. If there's anybody else who has any questions, you can either put it in the chat or open up your mic and uh, ask away. We have a few more minutes remaining, and then I'll shut off the recording at, at about 11.30. Great. And I just put that link in the chat. That doesn't have the school codes in it yet, but I will definitely get that done right after this webinar. And no, I, I was wondering where you, um, I missed the slide that said the levels that the kids follow, where it falls in line with their reading levels. Yeah, so we have, a, again, in that deck, there's a slide in there that shows um, the link between a school of park world, one, two, yeah. and five, and the county and canal level. So when we were in the Tri County testing the product over several months, what we did was we we got the kids reading levels, they found just some canal levels, and we actually did a big uh, data study on how the progress in our game aligned to specific levels of those kids in their testing outside the game. And we were able to find alignment um, between our levels and the found just some canal ones. So they're in that chart there in the presentation. Uh, it's really just a reference for you. The other way you can put in, when you're putting kids into the uh, program, you can enter them in at their grade level, or you can even select a world. So if you want kids to be working on, let's say, specific phonemes and specific sight word, words that are available in World 8 for a specific week, you can actually put them in World 8 that week. You can mo move your whole class into World 8. And so even if it's putting them outside of that scaffolded um, progress, it will allow you to focus on that one world and those skills that week, and then they can move back to where they were before before. And it doesn't affect them when they move back to the original world or? It won't affect them. No, they'll just go back to where they had left off. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. No problem. Uh, we have a question of, can we get the codes for international Nova Scotia schools as well? So I'm going to just ask you to reach out to me directly. Um, we, di we didn't create the codes for international schools, but I have been working with international schools kind of on a one-off basis. Um, so what we can do is we can create codes for those schools as well. I just need to, I need um, that individual to reach out to me so I can find out information about the school and create the account. And please know that we're here. So anytime you need to reach out, I'm, I'm really not that far. We do classroom visits too quite a bit. So if you ever want us to come in and bring some stickers into the students, I know this year might be a bit more difficult with class visits, but we're here. Thanks everybody for your, your comments. Really appreciate them.